welcome, uh, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. Um, unfortunately, um, Josh, our faithful host, won't be here, so you're stuck with uh, me, your political host. I am Will Wright, and uh, he is out this week um, because he heard that talking about critical race theory on a podcast is uniquely un-American. So to talk about critical race theory on this week's podcast, we have Daniel Hosing, who is an associate professor of ethnicity, race, and migration and American studies at Yale University. He also holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Political Science and serves on the Education Studies Advisory Committee. And he has a couple books coming out, um, A Wider Type of Freedom, How Struggles for Racial Justice Liberate Everyone, and Under the Blacklight, The Intersectional Vulnerabilities That COVID Lays Bear. So welcome, Daniel. Oh, thanks, Will. I really, really appreciate the invitation and looking forward to our conversation. And Sorry to miss Josh, but inviting him to come back so he can you know, get some faith in critical race theory. <laughs> yeah, you know, with, with with critical race theory kind of being in the news, omnipresent, um, you know, I'll I'll be the first to admit that I did not even know about it um, per se. And, you know, save of like the last six months or something. So. So kind of like as, as Michael Scott would say in the office, you know, why don't you explain what critical race theory is to me wow. like I'm five? Yeah, yeah. No, I, well, you're not alone in that. And I'll also have to say, you know, I'm um, someone who's, you know, worked with this, taught it in classrooms for years with, you know, other colleagues. It was also a little bit, of, you know, kind of astonishing to many of us how it went from something you know, we understood a, a relatively small set of people we're in conversation with to something that became the object of such like deeply felt uh, political um, kind of dispute, anger, um, et cetera. So um, I think we can get into this a couple of ways. Um, and just to say that critical race theory can mean different things in different kinds of settings. Um, the most straightforward definition is it's an approach to thinking about race and the law that really emerged in the mid to late 1980s, but there's a longer story behind that. And maybe we can start there with that story. Um, so as many of your listeners will know and remember, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, a series of landmark civil rights laws were passed, banning discrimination in voting, in housing, ending uh, formal segregation in education, opening up opportunities in uh, colleges and universities, and many other areas. And the thought at that time was that once those laws were passed, all of the remaining vestiges of uh, segregation, police violence, uh, racial inequality would soon wane away because they're no longer legal. The law says you can't do it. And if the law says you can't do it, then it's got to go away. Well, you know, um, a series of um, academics, not exclusively scholars of color, but there was a large concentration at the center, you know, go into law school in the mid to late 1980s. And they say, well, look, it's been 15, 20 years since these laws have been on the books. And we actually see patterns of racial inequality sharpening, heightening. In some ways, they seem to be getting worse. So how do we understand this? And uh, so it started with a series of questions and questions that related directly from people's day-to-day -day experiences. The law says this on one hand, and on the other, we look around and our reality is much different. Um, and so they brought those questions with them when they went to study the law at places like Harvard and the University of Wisconsin and um, other mainly liberal, um, sometimes quite competitive and elite schools. And that's the kind of start of the questions that uh, led to critical race theory. And it's, so it's a way of understanding the relationship between race and the law that doesn't just look at what the law formally says, but looks at how people actually experience it and kind of works from there. Wow, that, 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 that's a really good, I think, primer on, on critical race theory, better than I probably heard anywhere. Um, and it's, it's interesting when you're talking because we had, we had a uh, constitutional um, professor on the show recently to talk about um, like the death penalty um Karina Lane who's who's a wonderful person and great scholar and and um you know she she made the connection between um like the death penalty and how it's just sort of like lynching you know like legalized lynching <laughs> or something yeah. like that you know and and uh so so I'd imagine that probably critical race theory is like would cover like that that type of um I don't know like legal 
you know, justification for, for, I don't know, for racial issues? Is that, is that a good comparison? Yeah, I think that's a helpful way to think about some aspects of this. And really, I think, Will, what you're asking us to think about is um, how we think about history, how we think about historical legacies, historical events, and the ways they shape our present. So on the one hand, we can get a kind of a pretty simple story that many of us who went to school, you know, grew up in the U.S. get, which is like, indeed, there were some kind of original sins in the country, slavery, the removal and uh, conquest of indigenous people and their lands, other forms of forced labor. But, you know, over time, progress happened, the kind of people summoned their better angels, and those things went away, and they're largely a story of the past. And today we live in a so-called colorblind world where um, one status, your position, whether you're subject to the death penalty or to a jail cell or to, you know, getting COVID is you know, largely of your own making. That's a dominant way we think about history. Now, another way that might be the kind of opposite of that that's you know, also somewhat rigid is that nothing has changed. The same conditions 300 years ago are the same today. I don't know that many people subscribe to that, but I just want to say that's another way of thinking about history. I think critical race yeah. theory is inviting us to think in much more complex ways. Things cannot be the same as they were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, but it doesn't mean we're unrelated to the past. And indeed, to take up your example, the notion of like who is death worthy, who is cageable, whose life is um, uh, you know, not connected to the rest of the public and the, and the, and, and the um the kind of national community such that their their life can be sacrificed in some way. That's, you know, that's a very familiar idea in the origins of the country. And given the size of the number of people we incarcerate today, um, you know, a whole lot of other indicators, it's still an idea that's with us. And again, I think critical race theory invites us to grapple with those complexities, not to offer a, a single solution, but to say, look, history is complicated. And we think we're capable of wrestling with those complexities. Hmm, got it. So, so what are the what are the basic tenets of of critical race theory? Yeah. Um, kind of in preparation for this, I I've been reading and watching and trying to just better understand. And you know, nearest I can tell, there's like six tenets, um, maybe five. I don't know, but m m yeah. maybe you can kind of uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And um, you know, many people are trying to kind of get their heads around it. I would say generally, you know, we, we've seen accounts like that where it'll try to kind of offer a distillation of them. And um, uh, I, I, I just want to kind of be clear. It's not like there's a book that lists six uh, points that everyone kind of, um, <laughs> follows, but I think there's some basic. And it's probably helpful to first start with the dominant ways that um, many of us, uh, many people think about the law um, so the dominant way we often think about the law is that it's neutral, right? Think about the kind of the justice symbol um, that's indifferent towards uh, who you are, your position. The law applies equally to everyone. Um, this idea that the law kind of stands outside of society. It doesn't choose to favor or disfavor anyone. It's impartial um, and it delivers the same um, judgment and processes to everyone. So it, like the law is kind of separated from society and from social uh, power, social inequalities, et cetera. Uh, another dominant way we think about the law, and this is just to set up the you know, ideas of critical race theory, is that when racism happens or racial discrimination, it's unusual, it's irregular, it's apparent. Um, it's the bad actor, the person who's kind of like not um, thinking with their best, most generous mind, right? So it's an individual. Um, you know, a last couple of things, some notion that because the law is impartial, anytime the law recognizes race is equally bad. So white supremacy and um, discrimination against black people and other people of color is bad, but so too is affirmative action. Any recognition of race is bad. And finally, uh, and that's the principle of colorblindness, that uh, racism is often defined simply as individual prejudice, one individual acting in a discriminatory way against another. So this was the uh, kind of the, the basic ideas that are still taught in many law schools. And it's, again, the ideas that money is carry around. Critical race theory challenges each of those ideas. Uh, first, it says the law is not neutral. The law has often historically served to facilitate forms of inequality. And, it, you know, this is not that hard for us to get our heads around. The law is made by people. 
uh, judges, uh, you know, who interpret it, um, attorneys who argue it, uh, plaintiffs who bring their uh, cases, and of course, uh, legislators who make laws. So the law, of course, is going to reflect uh, a wide variety of social feelings, impulses, etc. The law is not outside of society. It's within it. So the law can never just step back from society. The law is society. Um, that racial uh, domination, racism, is not something just practiced by individuals. It's something that's every day. It's not irregular. Um, we can see this again across many aspects of life, healthcare, housing, education, um, employment, income, wealth. Um, it kind of permeates our social world such that we actually can't think of it as just being exercised by one, one person alone. Um, and that because um, racism is not symmetrical, in other words, historically, whiteness, has not meant the same thing as blackness, as indigeneity. Simply saying that colorblindness resolves that because everyone is being treated equal is actually not what justice is. You cannot treat unequal conditions equally. If you treat unequal conditions equally, all you do is reproduce the inequality. So that's a couple of them there, Will. Uh, no neutral spaces to observe the law. Racial domination is every day, something that's all around us. Um, not every recognition of race is suspect or wrong, um, and that to address inequality, we have to proactively think about how we undo uh, racial uh, domination. No, interesting. So, so if I'm understanding um, kind of your your summary there, is it is it is it like racism projects, um, you know, whatever you know the dominant race is. Um, you know, their, their, their viewpoints, whether, um, um, intentionally or unintentionally in the sense of, you know, you got a bunch of white people that are making laws like, um, and, in, in embedded within the, the formation of those laws is, is racism like ideology. Cause it just naturally excludes the, the, the people that aren't in the room kind of, kind of thing. Am I, am I, am I connecting the dots there or is, or is it kind of a reach? Well, it's, I think it's a little more um, maybe kind of like layered than that. Cause I don't think the, the category white in this country describes many, many kinds of people, people in different regions, people of different beliefs. It changes over time who's in it and who's out. So I wouldn't say there's any one quote unquote white outlook. I would also, you know, point out um, there's laws that have had a profoundly you know, devastating effects on people of color, um, our, our country's approach to uh, safety and um, crime um, that also affect many, many white people as well. So we wouldn't want to say, for example, mass incarceration, you know, there's um, we, we have what 5% of the world's population approaching 25% of the world's prisons prisoners. Um, that has a dramatic effect on Black life in this country. It also has a dramatic effect on many white people. So in this sense, a, um, a, a law that has very pernicious racial consequences is not just limited. In other words, it's not the white population as a whole trying to do something to the Black population as a whole. It operates in much, uh, you know, in more kind of complex ways. Mm. Now, now you're, you're, um, so your exp explanation about um, white people, um, um, explain a little bit more about sort of like the role that race kind of plays in the, the CRT model. Um, again, kind of based on my reading, you know, that, um, the theory sort of proclaims that like race is, is a bit of an abstract. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's see, we think of a couple of things. One is, again, this idea that um, racial discrimination is not just the action of individuals, but we can see it in um, policies and systems, et cetera. So let's, let's try to think about a specific place like housing. Um, uh, housing is important because for many Americans, working middle class Americans, it's where most, if you're a homeowner, it's where most of your wealth is. It's tied to many other aspects of life, the schools you have access to, um, whether you can withstand unemployment, et cetera, your health, et cetera. Um, housing has historically been provided across you know, uh, more than 100 years on a discriminatory basis. The federal government made decisions early in the 20th century 
to lend money to largely white, more middle class areas so that they could acquire homes, get mortgages, accrue wealth, etc. It did not do the same, didn't take the same action for black communities. This reflected, you know, longstanding um, uh, prejudices and beliefs about who could own a home, who was entitled to it, who was capable of, um, of, of you know, gaining wealth, etc. Over time, those forms of discrimination didn't lessen, they actually compounded. The white areas uh, accrued more value, they had more land, they were less dense. That's where jobs were located, that's where um, better recreational facilities and schools are. It compounded, and then as housing got a deeper kind of racial connotation, a quote unquote good area is white, a bad area is non-white, those things accentuate. So it doesn't take then any one individual deciding who they will or won't rent a house to or even one realtor. It's kind of baked into the system and it's not gonna stop on its own just through people individually saying they're colorblind or um, not racist. It actually needs a systematic action to undo what was done systematically. Got it. So, so, so CRT recognizes race more kind of from the, um, like the lagging indicator sort of aspect, like it, like, uh, cause I, I was always under the impression that, that critical race theory, you know, sort of doesn't believe in, you know, black, white, what, what have you Brown or, or, or whatnot. And I, I think in one reading, I, I, it was, you know, it's not a white person. It's like a, your, um, you know, European descent or like in my case, like I'm, I'm, my dad's black. My mom is Vietnamese. So like I'm African Asian descent or, or something like that. Is, is that, <laughs> is it, is that an accurate summary or, 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 uh, or is there more to it? Well, there's, it, it's a, it's a good way to kind of start us off, which is so, um, yes, there's an absolute, um, uh, sense that race doesn't reflect anything about, uh, biological about our bodies. Um, there's many forms of difference that people have. Um, those differences don't correspond to attributes, complex attributes in human life, our capacity to love, to think, to connect, to be responsible, to work, et cetera. Does that make sense? So there's differences, yes, but those differences don't correspond to um, intellectual, social uh, um, uh, abilities and capacities. Um, and that variation in those, again, intelligence, work, those are distributed across humanity, right? All of us kind of have different capacities. Um, but because race has been encoded into our laws, um, into our uh, uh, policies, everyday social actions, it has social meaning. So biologically, it's, it's a fiction, but it's what we would call a social fact. Now, there are other social facts, you know, being an American versus an Italian versus a Mexican, that's a, that's a social fact, right? It's something that human mm. societies have made up, but it has real consequences. So um, that's, it, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a bit of a complex way of thinking about it, something that can be socially constructed and made, but have real life consequences. And the last thing I'll say is, those social facts can change over time. So in the early 20th century, when there's millions of immigrants coming from Southern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, most of the Anglo-Saxon population in the US, especially the middle and upper class, did not regard them as being their kind of kin of the same race. They mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. viewed them as lesser and degraded and of an inferior stock. Um, and indeed, early immigration acts, the 1924 Immigration Act, is really targeted at Southern and Eastern Europeans in particular, who were viewed as polluting the Anglo-Saxon stock uh, and heritage of the country. Over time, across many, many decades, and through, you know, um, this is what history is, those um, so-called ethnic whites get absorbed into what we now think of as white. So if you ask someone you know, and, and a, someone who identifies as Italian American, what's your race? And you say, I'm Italian American. You know, you might get it. Oh, I don't think you understood my question. Maybe Italian American is your culture. Maybe it's your ethnicity, but it's not your race. Your race is white. 80 years ago, there would have been a different answer to that question. Similarly, if there's a person who identifies as black and you say, like, what's your ethnicity? And you say, well, you know, I ethnically identify, you know, in, in different ways. Um, you would say, no, but, but black is a race. 
So the, the very terms that we use to think about this change over time. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. That, yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. The, um, what about, is there a general consensus, um, among scholars like yourself of kind of what critical race theory is? Um, um, and if, and if not, like, what are some of the, what are some of the debates, you know, that, that you're having with your colleagues uh, about, you know, where, where, where it differs? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say also, you know, there's, a, it's, it, this isn't a kind of thing where we, um, folks have like debates about the kind of like, what's the canon or the master text or like, what's <laughs> the like dominant belief. Because it's really, yeah. it, it works itself out in kind of individual areas. I would say, you know, there's a, a really well-known um, reader on critical race theory that was, uh, it's called Critical Race Theory, the Key Writings that Form the Movement. It was released in 1995, kind of collected different essays uh, across the last, uh, I guess, the 10 and 15 years before that. And right on the first page, it says, look, this project is connected to two things. One, we are trying to understand why racial subordination, inequality, uh, continues within a system predicated on, quote, equal rights under the law. So how is it we have both? That's a complex idea. Yes, we have equal rights on the law. And yes, we have dramatic racial inequality. How do we understand that? And the second thing they say is that there's a commitment to transform social structures. And the, the, the terms they use there are an ethical commitment to human liberation, an ethical commitment to human liberation, which means the law, you know, Derek Bell, who's uh, a prominent legal theorist who passed away in 2011, um, he says right away in the beginning of his, um, you know, big case law book that's, that's used in law schools, he said, look, I'm not going to take a neutral stance towards the law. Um, the law should be used to free us so that people can live free, healthy, um, liberated lives for everybody. And that's not what the law has done. So um, that's partly what I would say is that we don't just um, have the sense that simply the law is just the law and it acts on its own, but we want to use the law to allow people to live uh, free, interdependent um, uh, lives. And I think that's where, you know, for this podcast, questions of faith, questions of what our ideal society is really do matter to uh, those of us wrestling uh, or thinking in the, the framework of critical race theory. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. One of, one of the, one of the things that, that has really kind of got me thinking a lot um, with regard to critical race theory and sort of like how a lot of the laws have like embedded within it, you know, some racial type of, or, or maybe, maybe that's not the word I'm, I'm smart enough to use, but just like, and, um, it disproportionately favors one one class of people over over another um, is the fact that all the people that wrote those laws, you know, benefit benefited or lived under Jim Crow um, in some capacity, uh, maybe not necessarily under those laws, but they benefited from, <laughs> from from having, you know, separate bathrooms or whatever, separate schools. And because uh, I was thinking my, my dad was born in 1928 in Oklahoma and um, he had to live through that. You know, like he had to use different restrooms, you know, <laughs> like he he uh, went went to war and, you know, he had to come back and be treated as like less than human for defending his country, you know. And and I just I just think to myself that like all of our history books and all of our whatever are are written by people that live kind of on the on the positive side of, you know, our our horrible you know laws that we had in this country. You know, so so kind of like in, in, in your in your view, you know, how, how much do, do you think that, you know, influences, you know, what we learn in school, what we, you know, like how we live our lives? Like like you mentioned earlier about like, you know, home loans being given to, you know, upper class or upper middle class, you know, white white people. So so how, how does how, how does the writing of history by the winners, you know, affect, you know, like me today. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that this is really helpful to imagine, you know, we often think of, again, all of this sense of like history is just this thing in the distant past. It's over. It has no consequence in our life. And I think you're sharing that story about your father. And you know, this is true for many, many people listening. It's true for many folks in our lives. These are all 
um, in a much more immediate past for us than we, you know, often care to acknowledge. Um, so, and really, even these the the anti discrimination laws in the books around housing, employment, etc., are really only effects of the last fifty years. So, for the you know hundreds of years of the history of the country, it's perfectly legal. The Constitution, perf- you know, defends the ability to afford to deny education to some and offer it to others, to deny employment to some and offer it to others. So, the law facilitated all of that. But I would just, you know, maybe offer a, an amendment to the, this question about winners and losers. Um, you know, the great scholar W. B. Du Bois um, uh, points out when he writes this history of Reconstruction, the period right after the Civil War, um, uh, after abolition and after especially freed Black people in the South are, are trying to rebuild the society, that many white people under slavery who were non-elite also had their rights limited profoundly. They weren't allowed to vote in many cases. Um, Their property owning rights were limited. They had very limited access to education. In some cases, no access. Elites wouldn't tax themselves to provide those goods. And it was during Reconstruction that actually the possibility of a genuine multiracial democracy was built that would absolutely center the lives of Black people there, but would be offer possibilities for many other people, including those that think of themselves as white. I think that's true in many ways for um, the, you know, landmark uh, efforts of um, civil rights organizing, right? To open up opportunities for people in education, to imagine that education is for everyone. Everyone has the capacity to think and act and deliberate and build together. Employment, right? To, to involve many more people to try to take apart the unequal structure of our society. So in that sense, you know, and this is, and Du Bois would say, look, these elites are trying to tell other whites, you're winning in this society, even though they were not actually participating in much of the kind of like rule, authority, and the good life. And so I think in many cases, it's actually not just that the history is written by so called, you know, the people who think of those as white, but people who have a certain vision that's rooted in inequality. And it's often been Black people and other people of color who have held on to a vision that it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way for, you know, for them and for us, but it doesn't have to be that way for society as a whole. Got it. So um, what about, um, is, is CRT taught like only in college or is it also found in K through 12? I think if, you know, if you watch any sort of media nowadays, depending on which, which side you'll, you'll be led to believe that, you know, kindergartners are being indoctrinated. Um, so, so what, 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 what's your take on that? Yeah, that's a, a really important question for us to consider here. So I would say as a, what we might call a formal matter, something you would see like on a syllabus, on a curriculum and a text, um, critical race theory, like today students were talking about critical race theory, <laughs> you'll mm-hmm. get in a small number, a small number of law schools, and you'll get in a small number of mostly social science uh, classes, um, maybe some ethnic studies, some gender studies classes in uh, undergraduate institutions, colleges, and universities. And I'm talking about a small, small number. Now, I, but I also don't want to um, you know, uh, respond to that question in a way that seems like defensive, because the ideas in critical race theory actually do shape um, the ways uh, teachers might approach other subjects. So let's think about in schools of education, the way they might teach the Brown v. Board of Education decision, which in 1954 says the constitution no longer permits uh, so-called separate but equal learning conditions, uh, that that violates the 14th Amendment's commitment to equal treatment under the law. Now, one reading of that is court makes a ruling, that ruling is the law of the land, segregation discrimination is over. Many people will say, well, why is it then that in 2021, many, many school districts in this country are more segregated than they were in 1954? To answer that question, you do have to take up some of the tools of critical race theory to think about things like local school boards, local control of schools, how school zones are organized, um, uh, uh, apparent opposition um, to uh, busing and other ways to integrate schools. So in that sense, the commitments of critical race theory, the questions it asks us to think about are indeed taught in schools of education. And many, I do a lot of work with individual teachers 
who even if they're not saying today's students were talking about critical race theory are absolutely asking students to think in complex ways about how the law relates to the society that they experience and inhabit. And in that sense, I think it's great. And I'll just say, like say this, I think many, most, if not all, white parents, even white parents that identify as conservative, do not want teachers lying to their kids. And I think when teachers want to engage the complexities of the world, when the students want to know questions about the world they experience, and, and, and simply offering back, well, you know, no, that's not what you're, what you're seeing is not, has nothing to do with racism and discrimination because of this 1954 law. That to me is not a helpful answer or way to, you know, relate to the, um, to students. So I think to the extent that teachers are trying to respond to the lived reality and complexity, critical re commitments of critical race theory uh, are indeed an important part of K through 12 education. Got it. So, so uh, there's two things that you said there that I, I I have questions about. So you stated that schools today, you know, maybe in some areas are still segregated um, to some degree. Like, can you can you elaborate a little bit more on on like what what you mean by that? Oh yeah, if you look at rates of um, uh, segregation by school, so the measures they use are the likelihood that a black student is attending a school that's uh, you know predominantly or all. Uh, black or uh, includes other people of color, and that's how this is measured. Those rates are in many, many districts higher now than they were 75 years ago. And if you look at almost all of the large urban school districts outside the South, uh, especially um, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Oakland, San Francisco, you're talking about profound levels of race and class segregation. Students are not integrated in any meaningful way. The law prohibits formal segregation. And yet, um, you know, just to take Los Angeles that I've written about, if you look at class photos of the kind of large public high schools in Los Angeles from the 20s, 30s, 40s, you will see far more uh, racial integration in those groups, even into the 50s and the 60s, than you will today. Uh, the same is true for many places. Actually, in the South, because of, in some ways, of the Brown decision, civil rights activists, that many school districts achieved. Uh, much deeper levels of racial integration than even schools in the North. The, the South was really mm -hmm. ahead on this for decades and decades, and only recently in the last 20 years have some of those um, dynamics rolled back. Now, they're not just, a, there's complex forces here. There's forces that shape housing markets, employment, um, you know, zoning, lots of things. But the point is, in, in practice, schools are profoundly, profoundly segregated today. Mm, interesting. And, and, when you mentioned Brown, um, the Board of Education, um, a lot of my research has has sort of touched on, you know, this idea of like interest convergence and how how we can view Brown v. Board of Education kind of through that lens. Can you can you explain like what interest convergence is and and maybe some of the the theories behind you know why Brown v. Board of Education isn't necessarily like the, the panacea of all like racial equality? Yeah, that's a really great question and important for us to think about. Um, so uh, first, the, the interest convergence is a term that was uh, developed and introduced by uh, Derek Bell, who I mentioned earlier. And uh, Bell had a long history of litigating these uh, desegregation cases primarily in the South. So he was in the courtroom. He understood Brown beginning to end and what it's made it for. And part of what he noted is that even after the law was implemented, the complex ways that parents, politicians, and others um, were able to evade the substantive um, commitment of the law, as he understood it and many others, which was a demand that uh, uh, education could no longer be provided on a racially segregated and indeed unequal basis. Um, and so the, what interest convergence argues is that unlike you know, the way the court might tell the story, excuse me, is that, you know, the these nine wise judges in black robes in 1954 huddled together and they said, you know what, this just offends our constitution, it shall not be. And it was just simply based on this moral, uh, you know, decision and a reading of the constitution that segregation was outlawed. Bell said that's not really what happened. Um, actually, there are all these political forces in the 50s, 40s, 50s in particular that shaped the court's thinking. 
there's the rise of the Cold War and, and uh, you know, the U.S. is concerned that um, as the Soviet Union is having more and more influence in other countries, it looks terrible for Jim Crow to kind of develop unabated and it causes them to lose credibility. There's, as you mentioned, returning black veterans, um, mostly men from uh, World War II in particular, coming back and fighting for freedom abroad and facing discrimination at home. There's some in the South, moderates, who are worried that this kind of like deeply entrenched Jim Crow system is holding back local economies. It's making the region seem backward. So there's all these forces that actually were in the interests of whites, elite whites in particular, to engage in some nominal desegregation. So interest convergence argues that it's only when the interests of white elites converge with those of, in this case, uh, black folks and other people of color seeking to end legal remedies that uh, you know some nominal change happens. It's not because of a big lofty decision. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, Bell would you know point out right after this decision, places like Virginia, but really all over the country, California too, what became known as segregation academies opened where parents withdraw their kids from public schools, send them to private school, um, and the private schools are effectively segregated, all white. There's you know hundreds of schools across the country who started during that time. That doesn't. There's nothing illegal. Doesn't offend the Constitution, but it demonstrates how uh, quick uh, many parents and districts were to evade Brown. And then most famously, um, there's a whole county in Virginia that just shut down its school system for years rather than desegregate. So um, the, the simplistic notion that the court passes a law and people simply obey its spirit is what uh, Bell was trying to get us to think in more complex ways about. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, 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 um, so I live in Virginia um, and um, I was joking with a friend once <laughs> about, you know, the, the array of different Confederate flags that I passed like to my drive to work, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, you know, so I, I have to drive down Jeff, Jefferson Davis Highway, you know, I pass mm -hmm. like two yeah. Confederate flags and then I, I, you know, have to turn like on Fort Lee Avenue, you know, <laughs> like, and, and it's just like mm -hmm. every street is named after somebody that probably wouldn't allow me to drive down their street, you know, and, uh, you know, so Virginia is definitely, it's, it's coming along, but you know, we got a ways to go. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think that's just look. One, it's a you know a reminder about the role of history, right, in our like everyday lives. All of those monuments have actually a specific history. Many of them were not. Remember, the South, the Confederacy, were traitors. They were insurrectionists. They rebelled against the standing government. So at the end of the Civil War, there were no monuments going up to the traitors. They had <laughs> caused the loss of life of hundreds of thousands of people. And it's only, and you know, in the immediate end of the aftermath of the war, the multiracial democracy that Du Bois talked about, that's what was being built. It's really only after the, you know, elite white northerners kind of abandoned that project, gave in to southern white elites and said, let's reconcile and kind of go back to the, you know, figure out an old order. That's when you saw at the end of the 19th century, all those monuments and street names being built. So they um, represented, it's, and, and that's why, you know, even for a person that thinks of as white to say, that's my heritage, there's no reason that that's your heritage, right? There's, there's, no one means that in any kind of genetic term. Um, that was what was offered to people. It was, it was a, a way to get them to imagine that this, um, you know, effort in multiracial democracy was not worth them paying attention to, and that this is the account they should accept. So um, even then, we, you know, you see a statue and you think, well, it's just been there forever. It's just the way it is. It's just honoring our past. No, it had a complex story. There were interests at work and it's not inevitable. So when we talk about wanting to challenge those monuments, it's not just about canceling something or putting something else. It's actually getting us to think about the history that generated those and whether and what legacies we want to embrace you know, today. Yeah, that's really good. So, um, so recently, um, General Milley, the uh, Joint Chief of Staff, he um, he was giving testimony um, at an appropriations hearing, and and the the topic of like an anti racist book that was promoted on on a reading list on a Navy reading list came up. Um, he 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 basically, when asked about it, um, I'm, I'm going to read his quote here. He says, 
I do think it's important actually for those of us in uniform to be open-minded and be widely read in the United States Military Academy as a university. And it is important that we train and we understand and I want to understand white rage, white rage, and I'm white, and I want to understand it. Um, so, so I'm I'm not familiar with the book, but I've heard the term anti-racist or anti-racism um, quite a bit. So, like, what, what's what's the difference between like anti-racist and just not being racist? Is there a whole philosophy behind it? <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, this has often more recently been associated with a scholar, I- Ibram Kendi. Um, he has a best-selling book, how to be an anti-racist and make this argument, but, but it's an argument, it's a long-standing argument, right? That if these forms of racial inequality are kind of baked into the system, they're constantly reproduced, refreshed across their thing. Simply saying, I choose uh, so-called colorblindness, which is itself a very, you know, uh, complex, uh, idea but like about what it means, but simply saying, I'm not going to act proactively racist means doesn't mean anything. Um, there's a, a wonderful sociologist at uh, Duke, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who has a book called Racism Without Racists, and you know makes the point: Look, we're in a society saturated with all of this inequality, and yet very few people proclaim themselves to be racist. So how do we understand that? And 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 you know again calls our calls our attention to these everyday ways that these um, structures work. So I, I think. You know, it's, I, I take it as a good sign that more and more people, you know, including white people, but also many people of color are trying to say, look, that notion of like, hey, I don't see race is not actually going to shape or, or change much of the inequality in the world as a good thing. Now, what to do from there um, is, is another question. And what role the military will play in that is a, an even more complicated. Got it. And so are there, are there other types of critical theories? And, and if so, like what role, um, does intersectionality kind of play uh, amongst those different types? Yeah. Well, let's just take the first part of the question. You know, I I think there's people that think of anti-racism as mostly an individual question. So I myself have got to like kind of so-called do the work, change my ideas, learn more history and context, you know, that, that can be important. Um, I think many of us would say that's, you know, maybe necessary, but not sufficient if it's not, uh, you know, connected to shared action, uh, the the changing of structures and policies and other norms, you yourself individually kind of declaring yourself anti-racist is not going to have much um, impact. Um, So, so you know, there might be a debate itself on um, uh, different accounts of uh, anti-racism. Uh, just quickly to the question of intersectionality, this is a term that's developed by the theorist uh, and organizer and movement thinker Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who is using it to try to understand why, how different forms of domination, domination on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, nationality, sometimes language, can shape and form and influence one another. And so she helps us think about the condition that, for example, Black women face under employment law, where the dominant forms of the law say, if you feel like you've been discriminated against, you can file a complaint on the basis of racial discrimination or gender discrimination, but they're separate. The problem there is if you're filing a complaint on the basis of racial discrimination as a Black woman and other Black men, let's say, have been hired, your, your complaint is going to be dismissed. If you file it on the basis of gender and other white women have been hired, your case is also going to be dismissed. And this is what Crenshaw helps us think about. So because these forms of discrimination intersect with one another, we need to have forms of law that recognize that so that in this case, black women's lived experiences and realities can actually be recognized and incorporated into the law. And that's where the term she develops the term intersectionality. Hmm, Interesting. But but there's like... um like uh a critical i don't know i'm I'm probably gonna butcher it but like critical asian theory or critical i think lgbtq theory or, or something like that yeah there's you know that's called uh age crit lat crit um and basically they're they're trying to you know critical race theory uh be in, in part because of the 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 
corpus of civil rights and anti-discrimination laws and around which was developed were, were developed in relationship to the experiences of African Americans. Um, although it was not, it was very much a multiracial project. Um, but these are the other bodies you're referring to are efforts by, you know, relatively small groups of scholars to say, okay, let's think about how we can use this to understand, for example, the experience of Native Americans in this country, a more critical approach to the law, Asian Americans, et cetera. Mm, got it. So, so what, what role does, does the, the, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones, 19 or sixteen nineteen project play in, in kind of what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, the, uh, the now, ban- you know, disbanded 1776 commission that was established and a report came out. Yeah. Um, so the, 1619 project, you know, it's chosen by the time the first ship uh, carrying enslaved people from West Africa arrived in the U.S. Um, And the argument is that rather than simply tracing the nation's history, its origin story to the formal founding, you know, in 1776 and the, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence, that the social forces which have shaped the nation's history actually have an earlier uh, kind of origin point. And one of those origin points, not the only one, but one of them is the um, uh, beginning and development of race-based slavery and subordination, which they used, you know, 1619 to kind of mark off. So, you know, I, I would absolutely invite, um, you know, listeners to go to that website. There's really interesting pieces about how mm-hmm. Race has shaped housing markets. It's a beautiful piece in a podcast about race and music. It's it's delightful yeah. and it actually it one, uses yeah. yacht rock, which is a genre many people are familiar <laughs> yeah, with. <I> know. <laughs> you know, um, and it says like this is like you know, and it, it unspools its uh, kind of origins in black musical traditions, and then how it kind of has shaped American popular culture. So these are like, you know, and, you know, of course, like anything you read, no one, there's, there's, and you read it, there's nothing dogmatic about it. You can agree with some parts, disagree with others. Um, I, 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 you know, I welcome, welcome debates over texts and ideas. And I think it serves no one's interest to just take a whole set of creative work and say, uh, the best thing that can be done by this is to have nobody engage it and read it. I think people are capable <laughs> of like much more complexity and exchange. And I, I also don't get, you know, it's like, there's a like kind of, uh, here's a little more partisan, like kind of um, condemnation of something that's called cancel culture. And then uh, in the next breath, this shall be outlawed. Um, mm. I, I don't know quite how people <laughs> get their heads around that. Um, and, and, you know, n- you know, in my classrooms and in nearly all my colleagues, you know, you put work out, students engage it, they have their own ideas. We never have any sense like you one dictates how people think, right? It's it's great mm-hmm. that people have diverse sets of ideas. So I, I there's nothing contrary to the 1619 project. That now just lastly, the 1776 project, you know, it was put together as this kind of like antidote to seven, you know, sixteen nineteen. It mostly gives a kind of pretty bland version of American history. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, if, you know, I have a parent of several kids. I want them if they're in class thinking, trying to think in complex ways, wrestle with things, kind of spoon feeding them a kind of pledge of allegiance history. I don't think they're going to be ter- terribly interested in. I'm not interested <laughs> in having them do it as a parent. There's, there's, we can do much better by our students than that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have two questions from uh, uh, a couple of our, our listeners. Uh, one is from uh, Willow from Washington State, who who leans um, to the right. And, and his question is, why why is it called a theory when many other articles or descriptions require an action in order to comply? Hmm. Um, well, if I think, you know, look, it, it, it was called a theory because the people were writing in conversation, the legal scholars, that's just the term they used. And um, I think in its best case, it's not divorced from action, not necessarily action by the state, meaning like laws, I mean, usually, but um, action in the way people interact with the world. So I'll just give you an example from my um, home state in Connecticut. So we, Connecticut, Northeast, liberal state, we live in one of the most race and class uh, uh, unequal uh, states in the country, segregated states in the country. <laughs> Um, we have the biggest income inequality. 
Um, if you go to the suburbs, and this is true in many other places, you'll see mostly, although not exclusively, but mostly white middle-class suburbs that have lower taxes, lots of access to land, uh, you know, well-resourced schools, et cetera, and cities that are mostly black and brown, um, who pay relatively higher taxes and poor services. If we want to, if we think that everybody deserves the chance to like think and live and have health, we have to do something about that. The way those are preserved is often through what you might think about as race neutral laws. So I'll just very quickly in Connecticut, zoning laws in many of the suburbs that say no multifamily housing is allowed, only single family houses. There's nothing about race in that law. And indeed, many of the residents say, why are you saying this has anything to do with race? But it's clear that that zoning law is what keeps those communities, uh, limits the housing availability and makes cities much more crowded. Now, those suburbanites, they come to the cities when they want to use government services, when they need you know, art galleries, universities, these entities that don't pay taxes, uh, and then they go back. So some people have said, hey, if we really want to deal with this housing, we've got to change this. You got to allow some multi, you know, a couple of small apartment buildings, other things. Let's work together and figure this out. That to me is applying some of the ideas of critical race theory to action. And um, mm -hmm. it's generating some interesting uh, conversations. And I think, again, it gives us tools to think about how we want to realize the society that, you know, many of us want to live in. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, the The next question is from Corrigan, who's in Georgia. He leans um, left um, and his his question is, what's the most compelling alternate explanation you have heard for why things are the way they they are? Um, and what about it was compelling, even if you ultimately disagree? Um, well, I, I can say that, you know, that like the dominant explanation about the kind of why things are the way they are. And I think by that we mean like, um, you know unequal access to resources, unequal life conditions, unequal mm -hmm. lifespans, is that it's strictly determined by, you know, how much people work, what their work ethic is, et cetera. It's all individual explanations. And I want to say, like, you know, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that, like, people's individuality, their, um, how they understand their lives, what they commit themselves to, their creativity, their intellect, doesn't matter. Of course that matters. That's part of what makes us human. Um, but I think we have a long history in this country of kind of like fetishizing that as if it's the only thing that matters, as if it explains mm. everything. And I think this is just an invitation to, again, think in complex ways. Both and thinking is possible. We can honor the individual gifts, right, that people have, their values, et cetera, just as we can say um, we can envision a kind of society in which all people um, have what they need. Um, and, I, and again, I think that's part of what critical race theory is inviting us to do. Yeah. Is, is it a, a good thing or a bad thing that um, critical race theory is kind of in the public sphere um, during this, I guess, time in history? What a great question, because, you know, if you had told me like five years ago, hey, you know, in there, like there's critical <laughs> race theory is going to go into the I would. That's great. We, you know, we, like, we've been struggling for this to happen. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, on these terms where I think, you know, so many people publicly are being deserved by just one getting like absolute inaccurate representations of the work and how it might shape their lives. I, I don't see how people uh, getting information that's distorted is useful to them. So in that sense, I don't think it's helpful, but I absolutely do think it's useful for us to think about um, ways in our everyday lives that we can ask uh, better, more productive questions about why things are the way they are, uh, how history shapes our lives, and how and what capacity we collectively have to change them. So, and because those are so central to critical race theory, I do think um, you know that there's lots of possibility. And, and as I mentioned, I, I work with a group in Connecticut called the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective. It's um, teachers, teacher educators, students, and you know these are wonderful, wonderful teachers who are really trying to be responsive to the questions their students have about their lives in the world. This is white students, white middle class students. Uh, students of color as well. And so um, that's where all of my faith and like hope lies in that these are fierce, effective, caring teachers who uh, want to be there and working through the tough stuff with their students. And they're not paying any attention to what I think is like just these kind of like um, 
it's not even distortions because they don't even deal. They're not a, you know, a representation. They're effort, they're kind of sideshows. Um, and I think they're doing the real work in the classroom and will all be better for their efforts to develop and train students who can think in these complex ways. Mm, awesome. Um, so kind of in closing, tell us, um, tell us a little bit about these, uh, books that you've got coming out. I think one of them's already out, right? Um, both are, uh, uh, coming very soon. Uh, just very quickly, this, uh, under the black light, um, is a collection of, uh, 50 beautiful essays that were recorded last year on a, um, actually on a, a kind of a, a podcast webinar from the African American policy forum, uh, with different folks trying as COVID was unfolding and uh, impacting so many of our lives, what it revealed about our larger society, what it revealed about our healthcare system, what it revealed about housing, the way we care for one another. Um, so that, you know, as COVID continues its march across so many of our communities, I think it's going to be a really helpful resource. And the second one is called um, A Wider Type of Freedom, How Racial Justice Liberates Everyone. And this is really about um, histories of racial justice and anti-racism that really did try to imagine new, new ways of um, uh, organizing the economy, new ways of thinking about governance and voting and democracy that would... Um, were centered around the people who had suffered the biggest uh, pains and violence of racism, but actually had possibilities for everyone. Um, and that's a really important tradition of racial justice uh, that I work to try to make uh, visible to readers. Oh, awesome. No, um, we will definitely be uh, be looking out for those. And I'll, I'll make sure I put the link in our in our show notes for those as well. The uh, um, But thank you so much for your time, Daniel. And this has been Awesome. I feel a little bit smarter about <laughs> Okay. It's something we're all working on. So I really appreciate the chance to talk to you, Will, and talk to your listeners as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you, listeners and viewers. And uh, we will uh, see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.